All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Scott Drake, who is over in Louisville, Kentucky. How are you doing, Scott? I'm good, John. How are you doing today? Excellent. And Scott founded Jump Coach uh, uh, as a as a journey to to reflect on his own journey into leadership, which was he, he says himself, you say it was a long and painful one. And you set this up as a passion project that became a social enterprise and you became a leader of leaders. And now you you uh, coach and research uh, and you help to create the next level of leaders. And what we're going to talk about today is accelerated leadership training, employee engagement, working better as a team of leaders. So just explain this concept of team of leaders and leader of leaders. Yeah, so, um, well, so leadership is one of those weird jobs that if you go and you ask a leader, how do you know you're doing a great job as a leader, right? You're going to see a lot of head scratching. A lot of people don't have a clear answer. Like my job, I came out of computer programming and I can tell you what makes a good computer programmer, right? Mm -hmm. I, I did sales for a long time. I can tell you what makes a great salesperson. But for the first decade of being a leader, I couldn't tell you what made a great leader. I would have said it's the same thing. that made. It's, a, it's a level up from being the salesperson. It's a level up from being the program. So what you see on leadership teams is you see a bunch of people playing different games, right? You see a basketball player and a football player and a soccer player trying to play this thing called leadership, but they're trying to play it as the different sports they came out of, not as a new game altogether, right? So yeah, so that's the, the challenge of leadership is learning that new game. And then as a team of leaders is to actually play the game together and play the same. Right, right. No, and that, and that, makes, that makes total sense because we all come to leadership positions, as you say, we all come on our own journey and our journeys are all slightly different. And even if we do come from the same you know, background uh, uh, or role, it doesn't necessarily mean again that our experiences that we bring to the table are the same. So we can still be playing a different game even when we're on this, even when we came from the same sport. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So when you, so what is the answer to this in terms of, of creating, you know, the leaders of the future? I mean, where is, le where is leadership going and what are, what are the things that are required today that perhaps maybe things that perhaps were always true and continue to be true today, but maybe things that are true today that maybe weren't true in the past? Sure. I think it's, it's much more important today, even in the past that I think leadership is important. I think if you look at the turnover, a lot of companies are facing, right? A lot of that is because people aren't being led well. They don't like the way they're treated at work, so they leave. Um, so yeah, leadership is, is, as a simple definition, is working through others to get things done, right? There's things you need done, but you can't or don't want to do them yourself, so you choose to work through other people. You're choosing not to do it yourself. You're choosing to work through other people. But so many of us, when we come into leadership, we're the expert. I was the great computer programmer, so I thought being a great leader meant being a great computer programmer and bringing everybody to my level. Or when I was in sales, being a great salesperson, we take the best salesperson and we make them the leader, right? But they're often the worst leader because they are, their ego is tied to what they came out of. My ego was of being a computer program. My ego was being a salesperson. So it's really the person who should become the leader is really the most, the most compassionate, the person who can see the world through the eyes of the people they're leading. And they can put the challenges and things that they want done. I'm the leader. I want this thing done, but I need to do it in a way that you're going to want to do it yourself, right? So what motivates you? What's going to make you want to do this? What's going to make you want to help me? Right. And that is not a great computer program or a great sales person that can do that. That is a a skill rooted in compassion and a skill rooted in caring about that person and leading that person. Right. So that's really where it's got to come from. And that is very different than history. Right. The way it's been done for 20, 30, 50, 80 years is very different than what we need today. Yeah. And there's a couple of interesting things there that I just wanted to pick up on. Uh, you know, the first is. Uh, and I think you mentioned this yourself, even in your bio, sorry, is about the, the imposter syndrome and about the fact that when people get into a leadership position, often they think I need to be I need to know everything. Uh, I need to kind of be an expert in everything. And we live in a world today where that's just impossible. I mean, there are so many specific uh, tasks or so specific roles and things that need to be done on a high level of expertise that you can't possibly uh, even know about everything. So you have to learn how to trust other people, but you also have to 
learn to trust your own instincts so that you're not being defensive all the time. Yeah, you have to detach your ego from that, right? You have to recognize that my greatness isn't by having all the answers, right? My greatness is now by getting other people to work hard and solve answers and solve problems, right? It's, it's, I, it's my last team. I had a guy who was a PhD, MD, PhD, right? He's got a medical degree and he's got a PhD in computer science and he's doing machine learning work for me, right? And it's like, I can't possibly outcompetent this guy. Right. This guy knows stuff that I will never, you know, but I've got to have a way to get value from him. So so it's really about being able to tap into the skills and the capabilities of your team more than giving them all the answers to the problem. It's challenging them with the right problems and getting out of their way to a point. Now, some sales, I say the one thing I will say about some sales, like you get up into, into, into some of the stuff that I think that your audience deals with more. That's yeah. very true for some sales. But I know some sales like, you know, when I sold computers at Circuit City, they had a way, you know, so part of my job as a leader back then was to treat was to teach my team the way. But then there was still a level of creativity there. Yeah, no, I think that's an that's an excellent point. That's, and and I think the other part is too, if you're going to be a successful uh, leader, you have to have some level of self awareness, and you have to understand what you're good at, what you're not good at, and maybe you know the self defeating behaviors that maybe you have. And I think this is important for anybody to do before they step into any kind of leadership mm -hmm. position. Yeah. Yeah, the, when we when we teach when we train leadership, the way I teach it is basically we start with that mindset piece, which is really detaching your ego from this thing of I've got to have all the answers, and then it's saying here's the here's the here's the here's the rule book for the new game. It's called leadership. It's not called sales. It's not called programming. It's called leadership. Here's the new rule book, and it's really pretty simple. And then it's how do you get better over time? So it really is that evolution of being able to say I think about it differently. I understand this new game. And now I'm going to go play that new game. Yeah, and I think the other thing too is that. Uh, is that often sometimes you know, we have that age old, you know, leadership versus management. But I mean, I think if you're going to be a good leader, you also need to be a good manager as well. I don't think that two you can really operate in a mutually exclusive fashion. And I think that's also where we fall down. Sometimes we put people in leadership positions. We don't train them to be leaders. We don't even train them to be good managers. Yeah, it's it's. One thing I work with a lot, with especially with tech companies, and I think sales and some other places can be, is, is that often a promotion is the reward, right? We want the reward. Everybody wants the reward. I want to be rewarded, right? You want to be rewarded. Everybody wants rewards and recognition in their work. They want status increases. They want pay increases. And the only way to get that status increase and pay increase a lot of times is to take a promotion, even if I don't want it, right? Even if I'm terrible at the job and I don't want it, it's the only way to get that status gain. So what we do a lot in tech and what I really advocate a lot of other companies do as well is to say, how can I give status increases? How can I give pay increases to people without moving them into management if they don't want to be in management, right? So that's the other thing about it too, is that we really as leaders have to stop and think about, you know, how do we, how do we give those things to our team without necessarily routing them? Because most people aren't going to like management, right? Most people aren't going to like being a leader. It's, it's a tough job. It's a thankless job. It's hard. Right. It's it's hard, but but and a lot of people just aren't going to like it. So you don't necessarily want to do it. Yeah, no, it's great. I, I mean, I sometimes think it's a bit like, uh, you know, being a politician. I think if you want to be a politician, it should disqualify you immediately. <laughs> it's true. I agree. <clears throat> but what you say about it. Yeah. yeah. But I think this is a really is a really key and fundamental point that you just raised there is that we kind of have this singular path. Right. Where, as you said, uh, you know, maybe you're a salesperson, you're a top quality salesperson, but your next step up is sales leadership. That should not be the only option available to you. You should have a path where if you're not going to be, you're not interested in being the leader, you're not interested in being a manager, you don't have the skills for it, it's not where your passion is, we should have some other path for you. Instead, if you ask, as you know, well, no, if you ask people, you know, you're doing performance reviews. Oh, what would you like to do? Oh, well, I, I would like to manage people. And I always go, really, you do? Do you want to know what that's like? Yeah. <laughs> but we have a singular path for people. Yeah, it's hard. And it's, 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 I think part of the challenge is to, that people grow over time, right? The things that were exciting to me two years ago are kind of boring, right? Mm -hmm. I think salespeople may be a little bit different because it's just, they get to go play a game that they're wired to play. Right. So I don't know that they get quite as bored, but sometimes, yeah, it may be this person doesn't feel they're having the impact they used to have. So can you move them to a different line? Can you move them to a different product group? Can you move them to a different customer base or something that will introduce a new challenge? But they're still playing the same game and using the same skill set and natural talents that they have. 
but there's some new challenge to it, right? So that's that's often what people need more than the promotion to a job outside of their skill set is they need some way to find a new challenge within their own existing competency. But but companies aren't structured to do that because historically that's just not the way we were set up or organized. But I do feel like as we move forward and as we look at the decades to come, more companies and more you know leadership teams need to start thinking about uh, their their organization structures in those ways because I think that's going to become more important. Yeah, I know I couldn't agree more, and I think not just yeah organization structure, but also how how the company is organized in terms of being able to operate with permanent employees, uh, contract employees, semi permanent, virtual, in the office, hybrid, the, you know, across the globe, uh, different time zones. There's a lot of challenge, and I think this is where the challenge of leadership uh, becomes exponentially more difficult because. Uh, you know, traditionally you had a lot of people in an office and you led them. Now they could be anywhere in the globe and they may not even be full-time employees. So you need to adapt. There's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, adapting that is needed to be done in order to meet the challenges of the way work is today and is going to evolve in the future. Yeah, and there's really two, there are a couple of things in that. Number one, it, it speaks to the need of more people having basic leadership skills. Right. You need more people who can step in and out of those quote unquote leadership roles of working through other, of organizing that work of others and helping other people contribute. Then the other thing to recognize is that a lot of us are trained from a management standpoint to think about efficiency. It's all about efficiency and consistency and predictability. Right. But a lot of these teams that get stand, you, know, you stand up and you take them down, you stand up, you take them down. They're there to solve innovative problems and you can't solve innovative problems managing in a mechanistic way. Right. So, you, so that makes the, uh, the doubly hard. Now your managers have to think they can't just treat everything as mechanistic, mechanistic. I'm going to create the process. You're going to execute the process. It is, we're going to solve this unique problem and I don't know how we're going to do it. That's a different kind of leadership, a different kind of management. So we have to teach our leaders both, both styles of management. And that's the other thing I think that makes it a little bit more challenging. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's and I think it really is something that companies need to start focusing on uh, coming out of the pandemic and all the changes we've seen and the evol the natural evolutions. What are, what are some of the new challenges you think leaders have that perhaps they didn't have two years ago or perhaps they weren't as maybe uh, as relevant or, or as or as important as they were two years ago? I think I think the shift to remote work is fantastic right i've been i've managed to work myself 14 15 years into remote work so I, it's been something i've been doing for a long time the challenge is it's very hard to build connected teams it's very hard to build teams that feel cohesive and like a family when they can't get together or when they don't get together very often in my last role um you know we had we would get together at least once a month for a whole day in a classroom and we would just work right and, and there's situations like that, that I think companies that have been now thrust into this remote work thing, which I think is for the better, I think it's for the better for everybody, are really going to have to find those ways to say, how do we, how do we help people uh, build these connections and build these bonds so they care about each other and so that they can work together well. And so that we really are not just this collection of of uh, people who don't really care, but how do we actually make them care? And I think it's gonna be a really interesting challenge to see come together, whether it's people doing retreats, whether it's people doing, you know, where you would normally, you would have an executive team go off to a, to a retreat for two or three days. Now you're gonna have entire companies or you're gonna have departments. You're gonna have, there's gonna be some new things that are gonna come about. I don't know what they are, but it's gonna be interesting to watch. And, and I think that that's one of the big areas that they have to start looking at. It's just really, how do we really, bring this team together and build the bonds of the teams. Yeah, and I, and, and I totally agree. And I think that's a, that's a, it's a massive challenge because I think the other part of it is that if you have a, you know, if you have a virtual team or even a hybrid team or, or whatever, one of the other things I think is, and this is the onus, not just on leaders, but it's on, on, on employees as well, is if you need to reconstruct your working day and have it work a little bit differently than it used to when you're in the office so that you can maximize being virtual, maybe maybe bringing your kids to school in the morning is really important now. Maybe that's something you've been doing. It's, it's really important. Maybe even picking them up or whatever. 
So you have to have that dialogue about, I need to reconstruct um, my working day. And as leaders, we need to have the flexibility or the open-mindedness to say, okay, yeah, maybe we can organize this differently and let's see the results of it. Let's focus on the results rather than getting too trapped into traditional constructs. Yeah, I think, I think we have to look at what are, what are the gains that we have from this? What are the benefits? And like, for example, I do my best work, my most creative work from about six in the morning until about 11 o'clock. Right. So if I can, if I can get up and start working at six, you will get more out of me in those four or five hours than you would have with 10 hours, me starting my day at the office at eight. Right. So you can actually get far more value from me if you let me work when I am most productive. And the thing with this remote now, we can't, right? Yes, I will start working at six, but I'm going to take a two or three hour lunch so that I can work out so that I can go run some errands so I can do something else. And then I'm going to come back and I'll work three or four hours in the afternoon, right? Though that type of flexibility, if we can build it in, we can actually get far more value and from, from people and people are going to be happier and they're going to have, you know, better work-life balance. And they're really going to be wanting to be engaged because they can work when they're at their best. So I think that they're, they're, it's going to be a challenge for a lot of managers who like to control, right? I mean, that's just a natural part of we just want to make sure things are happening the way we think they should, right? But we've got to kind of learn to give that up, but then look at the benefits of the things that we're going to get. And there's a lot of things that we can get from remote. Yeah, no, and I agree. Absolutely. Look at the benefits and put the right metrics in place. Make sure you're measuring correctly. Uh, the contribution and then and then as I said you can compromise on how things are constructed but I do think this is a challenge for leadership because I, I think that good leaders going forward are going to get out ahead of this and are going to start thinking as you just rightly pointed out how can we make this work and what are the benefits of it as opposed to this is a pain I wish I could just have people here the ones who get out ahead of it and really are proactive I think are going to win. Yeah, I've seen a lot of companies embrace this idea that, hey, I'm sitting in New York or I'm sitting in Boston, but I can hire that guy in Nebraska and or I can hire that lady in Atlanta. And they, they are starting to kind of see the, the, the ability to tap talent that they haven't had access to. And I think that that's another just really exciting thing that's going to happen. I, I, it's going to be fun to watch. The next 20 years is going to be really fun to watch. Yeah, no, it, it is. And I, and I think, uh, you know, people are, are voting with their feet. I think it, I, I often say, I think it started with the financial crisis, because I think this was, that was the first time when a lot of people woke up to the fact that, why am I locating myself in a high cost area with a, with a ridiculous mortgage to be within a two hour commute of, of the office. And then when there's a business downturn or a, a catastrophe, like, you know, the financial crisis, guess what, I'm first out the door. I'm let go. I have an expensive, I live in somewhere I can't afford to live now. And I think a lot of people are going, okay, I'm going to locate myself somewhere with the right standard of living for me, with the right environment for me. And then I'm going to go find a job. So to your point, I think there's a lot of talent out there. And, and I think we should be embracing it because at the end of the day, if your employees are happy in their, in their home lives, their personal lives and all of that kind of stuff, they're going to be much more effective in their work life. A happy person is going to add the skills they need to add, right? They're going to they're going to fit in. They're going to do what they need to do to fit in, right? They're going to be they're not going to quit over a small change in pay or a small change in perks, right? So if you can really focus on what makes people happy and deliver it, then you're going to get so much more out of them. Hundred percent agree. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So I think that's a big challenge for leaders, and as I said, the ones who get out ahead of that are going to be the ones who, the ones who win. And the other thing about uh, about leadership uh, is is I think sometimes people think leadership as kind of inspirational. You know, if I sort of stand up and make some inspirational comments, I mean, there's a time and a place for that. Um, or if I just lead by example, but there's so much more to it. And I think, uh, I think sometimes people take a very narrow view of the skills needed for leadership. Yeah, so, so there's nine jobs. We teach people there's nine jobs of leadership. And one of them is to set the vision. And you can be an inspirational vision setter or you can be a boring vision setter, right? It doesn't really matter. As long as the vision is clear, that's the most important thing, right? So yeah, so it, it is one of those things. It is not, it is not a pre-requirement. Uh, there are some people who are quote unquote those natural leaders, but about 80% of us can learn it, right? There are about 10% who can't, they just, they just don't have the compassion. They can't develop that empathy or care about people enough to really be a good leader effective. But the rest of us can learn it. It really is just about learning uh, you know, it's about learning those nine jobs and making sure that those things are happening. And if you do those, then pretty much everybody can do the job. 
Yeah. And you just you touched on empathy there. And I think that's a, a, an incredibly important one. I think, uh, you know, those who have good high levels of empathy and emotional intelligence as leaders probably navigated this and their teams navigated the last couple of years better than other people. But I also think sometimes people misunderstand what empathy really is. I mean, sometimes they confuse it with sympathy and things that mm-hmm. you just, uh, you know, you just uh, sympathize and put yourself in their shoes and understand. But it's it's more than that. And sometimes it actually means having hard conversations. Yeah, I think I think empathy is, is tough because and, and I've heard somebody else describe this and I'll say this, but and I'm not taking credit for it. But it's it's empathy is important, but empathy is the ability to kind of see and understand the world through somebody else's eyes and perspectives. And I feel like not everybody can do that well and not every leader can do that well. But what every leader can do is be compassionate. They're like, I can't necessarily see the world through your eyes, but I care. I care about you and I'm going to do what I have to do to take care of you. Right. And that's more important, in my opinion, that compassion piece is even more important than empathy, that that it's really. But it is that you have to care about that person. Right. Your job is to work through them. But you got it. It's so much easier when they want to help you and they want to help you if you're compassionate and you care about them. Yeah. And as I said, sometimes being compassionate means that you have to deliver hard truths, because yes. at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you want that person to succeed you want them to do well and uh, enabling or indulging them isn't helping them. I had a, I had a fire guy a year ago, the most compassionate thing I've done in a long time, right? Because he was not in the right seat. He was a great guy in the wrong seat, right? And I worked with him for a long time and tried really hard to, to, to make it right, but it just didn't work. So it's terrible as it sounds, the most compassionate thing to do is let him go and let him go find some place else. And the funny thing is, 60 days later, he landed in a perfect seat, right? So that's, yeah. that's, the, the, that's one of the things about leadership. Yeah, and I love that you brought that up because that is, I think, one of the one of the thing one of the hardest lessons for for leaders to learn or even managers to learn is that point is that if you keep somebody in a job where they're struggling and they're failing and there's and you've tried everything, nothing's going to work. It's not their skill. You are actually being selfish leaving them in that job. It's not you're not being compassionate. You're actually being selfish. You're avoiding something and you're being selfish because you're robbing them of the opportunity of finding something or finding the right fit for them. Yep, absolutely, hundred percent agree. Yeah. So, and the last question: uh, What do you think? Where, where, where do you see leadership going in terms of? I mean, do you think this is something where more people are going to recognize kind of the work that people like you do and say, you know, we really need to get on top of this and we really need to train our leaders better? Because I still feel that, yeah, you know, there's some, there's, a, there's a lot of technical skills training. There's so-called soft skills training, which is the worst name ever, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. To, to name something as soft skills, because that just sounds like something that any executive can go, well, we don't need that. Uh, but but real leadership skills, we rarely really address those. I think, again, I think it's a lot of people assume that it's an outgrowth of the function I came out of. You were a great salesperson, you're going to be a great sales leader. Not the truth, right? So I do think that we continue to fight that battle of of people thinking that that it's not a separate skill set altogether. I also see a lot of people who think other people need it, but not me, right? I, I see that an awful lot. And there's an awful lot of, of mediocre to good leaders who could be great leaders with six hours of training, right? It's, it's, it's been in just some, some honest reflection. So yeah, I, 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 do I have a crystal ball that makes me believe I'm hopeful that people will embrace it and do more. I think one of my big things I think what turns a lot of people off is it's very overwhelming. There's tens of thousands of books on leadership on Amazon. It's very overwhelming, and it means different things to different people. So that's one of our big things that we're trying to do is simplify it. And we're trying to say that different people are going to lead in different ways, but there's some core pieces to it, or so here are the core pieces. So I think you know that's part of our goal is to really simplify this, make it accessible, and, and not make it some big workshop you got to go sit through that you're going to get bored at. Right. So, so I hope so. I, because to me, it is truly the differentiator that is sustainable. If you can really build up a, a strong leadership culture and a strong culture of good leadership, modern leadership is something that can carry even mediocre ideas to great heights. Right. Uh, it, it, it truly is a difference maker. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I love that. It's like, uh, as you said, a lot of people think other people need training. Yeah. It's like accountability. Everybody agrees on accountability, but they think you should be accountable rather than starting with themselves. So yes. It's always an interesting human, human beings. We're an interesting species for sure. <laughs> yeah, hey, we are. Uh, 
Yeah, listen, Scott, this has been fantastic. All of Scott's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, Scott, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and Jump Coach. Yeah, so the best thing you can do if you want to learn more about me is just go to jumpcoach.com. Uh, one of our tools, we, we put out a, a free uh, assessment and a scorecard that's based on our, our scorecard. I said, you know, there's nine jobs of leadership. And if you're curious what those are, there's four goals of leadership. If you're curious what those are, you can take a 10-minute assessment on the site. It's totally free. There's no email required, no nothing. But what it'll do is it'll kind of show you the map of leadership. It'll show you that in, in where are your gaps. What are you doing well? And what might you not be aware of? And where do you need to improve? You can get those answers really easily on the site through that assessment tool. Uh, and if you're interested in training, you're interested in coaching and some of those other things, please reach out. That's, that's what we do. It's what our passion is. And, uh, and our goal is really to, to help make uh, leadership much more accessible, much, much easier to learn so that, you know, really we can unlock the potential of all these companies. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I really encourage people, there you go. It's a, it's a free assessment, no, no uh, email required or anything. I would encourage you to go there because I think this is the year and it's always the year, but I think more than ever, this is the time to invest in yourself. So, you know, go check it out, go check out uh, Scott and Jump Coach is assessment and, and figure out where you are and, and, and focus on whatever, whatever gaps or skills that you need to make this so that you can be the best leader going forward. And to be honest, if you invest in yourself, even as much as just doing Scott's uh, assessment, you're probably doing more than like 80 to 90% of the other leaders. So that should be a good incentive too. Absolutely true. All right. Well, listen, thanks again, Scott. Thank you all for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thanks, John.